All right, good morning. Welcome, welcome to the fountain. My name is Josh Rahan. I am the pastor here. Hey, if you are brand new with us this morning, we want to say welcome to you. We're so glad that you've chosen to join with us. Uh, today is a great day to be in the house of the Lord, and you have chosen a great day to be here uh, because today we are beginning a brand new series of messages called uh, Closer. Drawing closer to God and one another through spiritual disciplines. And so uh, we're going to be talking about some ways in which you and I can grow closer to God and to one another. Now you might remember how back in uh, in March, way back in March, we were in a series of messages called Rooted, in which we talked about spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines are practices that we put into our lives that enable us to hear the voice of God. We want to better hear His voice in order that we might listen and learn, understand what He's trying to say to us. And so we began uh, way back in March a series of, of messages. It was eight weeks long called Rooted, and we said that we wanted to grow in our relationship with Christ. We wanted to be rooted in, in Christ. And it was based upon a particular book a book called Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. And within this book, we talked about the first eight spiritual disciplines. Now, in his book, he divides it into three different sections. There are uh, internal uh, disciplines, there's outward uh, disciplines, and then there's something that he calls corporate. And so previously, we looked at the uh, inward disciplines, And those are the disciplines of meditation and prayer and fasting and study. Those are things that we do internally in the way in which we uh, listen and hear God's voice. And then we talked about outward disciplines. Disciplines that Richard Foster included uh, were uh, simplicity, solitude, submission, and service. Those are things that we do uh, on our own externally. People can see us doing those. And now we're going to take a look at, within the next several weeks, uh, corporate disciplines. These include confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. And so these are disciplines that we need to learn how to do together. And so within the body of Christ, there are certain spiritual disciplines that God has given to us, practices that He wants us to do together in order that we might grow closer both to God and to one another. So that's where we're heading throughout the month of November. That's where we're going over the next four weeks. So um, are, you, are you with me? Does that make sense? Is that where we're, where we're headed together? All right, let's begin with a, a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, God, as we begin this, uh, this series together, and as we begin to examine some more spiritual disciplines, I just pray, Father, that you would begin to, to stir our hearts. I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to to all of us, wherever we're at. That, God, you would be the teacher, that you would be the ones to to speak into our lives, helping us to understand uh, what are the disciplines, what are the practices that we can put into our lives uh, as the body of Christ in order to grow closer both to you and to your Son and to one another. And so, Father, would you be the one to speak to us? We need to hear your voice. We need to hear from your word. We want to grow closer to you. So help us to do that uh, in the coming weeks ahead and today. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus, our Christ, and our Lord. Amen. And amen. Well, this past week was a bit of a crazy week, if you remember. There were some things that took place that were a little bit uh, squirrely, strange, uh, a bit crazy. If you think back with me about some of the things that happened, I think about uh, what happened on Wednesday night. Wednesday night, the Washington Nationals beat the Houston Astros to win the World Series. And in doing so, they became the first team ever, and really this is the first series ever, where the home team never won a game. Did you know that? It's crazy to think about that every single home team lost. And so when they went to Houston for Game 7, of course, the visiting team, the away team, won. And as a result, the Washington Nationals are the World Series champ. Well, then Thursday night was Halloween night. And what happened Thursday? We got a bit of a snowstorm, right? On Halloween of all days. That's a bit crazy, a little strange. Uh, I received a picture from my father-in-law. It should be behind me. And uh, he lives up in Valparaiso, and you can see how much snow that they received. We didn't get quite that much, but we did get quite a bit of of snow. And so on Halloween night, uh, we were getting ready to go out, and uh, 
Uh, the boys and I were going to be heading out and doing different things, and so Andrew dressed up as a man riding a red dragon, which is kind of an interesting costume. And I told him, I said, when we go trick-or-treating, you need to tell every person that you go to in New Pal that that's a New Pal dragon, okay? They'll give you extra candy, and, uh, and I'll get some of that candy. Uh, and so we went out. Uh, I took uh, Andrew and Rylan Edwards out, uh, and we went uh, trick-or-treating. Uh, Will dressed up, too. He dressed up as, as Forky uh, from Toy Story 4. Now, I always want to call him Sporky because he's a spork, right? But he's actually Forky. And so uh, he dressed up as that, went out, uh, did some fun things with some friends. And uh, I dressed up, too, but I went out as a snowboarder because it was snowing and, uh, and I was going to have to brave the weather. Uh, and so I had several layers on, and we went out and we had a great time. Went through the neighborhood, and we went trick-or-treating, and one of the things I love about trick-or-treating, of course, is you get to see what everybody else is wearing, and so I saw, of course, uh, children dressed up as superheroes. We saw Captain America, and I saw uh, princesses, and we saw uh, a, a new pal football player, and so he's dressed up as a, as a football player, and uh, sports heroes and things like that, and so that was a lot of, of fun. Uh, then we came back, of course, at the end of the evening, and uh, we were looking through all the candy and doing all the things that you do at the end of the night, and it got me to thinking about this whole idea of costumes, wearing costumes. Many times when you put on a costume, the most important piece is that mask that you have to, to put on your face, right? Because the mask kind of enables you to pretend to be someone that you're not, and so whether you're trying to be um, a football player or a superhero or whatever the case may be, that mask kind of hides uh, your identity and you can kind of pretend to be uh, somebody that you're not. But imagine this scenario. Imagine that uh, a young person who went trick-or-treating on a Thursday night goes to school on Friday morning and they don't want to take off their mask. And so little Steve comes into his kindergarten class, maybe, and he was Superman, and he's flying in. He comes in and tells his teacher, okay, I'm Superman today, and I've got my costume on. And so when she talks about uh, things that we need to do during the day and wants to teach him a little bit of math, he says, nope, not going to do math because Superman doesn't need to do math. He's got to learn to fight crime. I don't need to do math. And so what do you think would happen in that scenario? The teacher would not have anything to do with that, right? Or imagine a little girl who comes strutting in, and she's just kind of walking around. She's dressed as a princess. She comes up to her teacher, and she says, I'm a princess. And, and oh, okay, you're a princess today. All right, well, we do know we have a science uh, project to do, don't you? And she says, no, 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 I'm not going to be doing science today. I'm a princess, Prince Charming. He'll do the science for me. Not going to go over well, right? Because at some point, no matter how uh, big or small children might be, they have to learn something very important. They have to learn that it's, there comes a time when you have to stop pretending and you've got to take off the mask. Little children need to learn that. But what about God's little children? What about adults here in the room? How often do we wear masks? How often do we pretend to be someone that we're not? How often do we pretend to forgive someone when really we've not forgiven them in our hearts? How often do we pretend to, to love Jesus and to walk with Him when really day to day we're not doing that? How often do we pretend to be someone that we're not? Have our life all figured out and no real problems when deep down inside there's some major issues? maybe within relationships in our life. You see, it becomes a huge, huge problem when adults pretend to be someone that they're not. And this morning, I want us to think about where we are within our lives. I want you to think about how that has crept into to your life as it creeps into mine and how we can pretend to be someone that we're not because today we're going to take a look at a passage of Scripture which speaks to this issue. It's going to speak into our hearts and minds, and God is going to want to address this. And so I want us to talk about that and think about how you and I can learn to take off the mask. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me now to the book of 1 John chapter 1. And today we're going to be examining all 10 verses within this chapter, and so if you'd like to follow along within those black Bibles in front of you, we're going to be on page 1021. 
And that's page 1021. Also, if you'd like to follow along with us online, uh, you can do so by going to yourfountain.info. Uh, this is our in-service website. And so if you pull up that website and click on the, uh, the Learn link, there you will find today's passage of Scripture along with a way to take notes. And as you turn there and as you uh, prepare uh, for that, I want us to uh, also think about why John wrote this letter. What is the background? What's the backdrop to uh, 1 John? Well, the book of 1 John was written by John, who was the disciple John. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. And he wrote Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, he gives a, a letter, seven letters to seven different churches, one of which he wrote to the church in Ephesus. And if you've been studying with us on Wednesday afternoons as a part of our Revelation class, you know that John, on the island of Patmos, wrote this letter to this church in Ephesus. And we talked about how it's very possible that was his home church. We know John spent a lot of time in Ephesus. And so it's believed by scholars that John wrote 1 John from Ephesus to go along with his gospel, the gospel of John. And so it was a letter written to kind of introduce people to certain ideas and to talk about some problems in the first century church. And in particular, John needed to address false teachers and what he referred to as antichrists. These are people who were teaching false doctrines, who had come into the church, were teaching some false things, and then he said they were in with us, and they left us, they went out, and so we know they were not a part of the body of Christ. They're not a part of the church. And he talks about that in chapter 2. And so the focus of this letter was to address these, these teachers who needed to remove their own mask. And so with that as a background, let's now take a look at what John had to say in John chapter 1. We read this. 1 John chapter 1 says this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. All right, let's stop and think about this text. What is John trying to say? We talked about how John is going to write this letter and he wants to address these false teachers and he wants them to remove their mask. Let's talk about how he does that and how he begins this particular letter. And I want to make a couple of quick observations. The first thing I want you to notice is to notice the man that he's referring to. He actually begins with a concept, but then it becomes personified. And he starts with this concept in verse 1 of the word of life. He says, the word of life was that which was from the beginning. And the word of life was something that we have heard. Well, that kind of makes sense. I mean, you hear words. But then he goes on to describe how the word of life is also something that we have seen with our eyes and touched with our hands. And so who is he referring to in this moment? He's referring to, to Jesus. And we know that because he continues and he tells us that this word of life was manifested to us. He, he was made to be flesh. 
Now, John had begun his gospel in, in John chapter 1 and verse 1 by saying this. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then later on in verse 14 of John chapter 1, he says that the Word became flesh and, so, and dwelt among us. And so he tells us that the Word of God existed from the very beginning, came into this world, and took on flesh. And so here he's repeating that same idea. You can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, and you can read in the first couple of verses how there was God the Father, God the Word, and God the Spirit, who are part of creation, who spoke and created all things. And so the Word of God existed, and John is saying the Word was made flesh, and that Word was the Son of God, was Jesus. And so that's who he's referring to. Second, notice the mission. So why did Jesus come? Well, he tells us that as well. In verse 3, he says, so that you may have fellowship. Jesus came into this world so that you and I might have fellowship with our Heavenly Father. That through his death on the cross and his sacrifice for our sins, we're able to have fellowship both with God and with one another. That was his mission. That's why he came. That's why it was so significant that the Word took on flesh. But there's something more. Notice third, the message that John then gives. So based upon those things, verse 5, the message is that God is light. God is light. This is the message that we're bringing to you. Light has come into this world. God, God, he says that light separates the darkness. Light overcomes that which is dark. Light can have no fellowship with that which is dark. And so for that reason, there can be no fellowship with, between God and those who live in darkness. And so John says, if we say that we're in the light, but yet we walk in darkness, we can't have fellowship with God. We make him out to be a liar because God is light. But he says, if we confess our sins... We can be cleansed. We can be forgiven. We can walk in the light and not only uh, be in a right, proper relationship with God, but also others who are walking in the light as well. And that's why John gets to where he does as we, we get down to the very end. And I want us to focus on verses 8 through 10 because this is the section that I want us to really pay attention to. Let me reread verse 8 to you. Verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar and His word is not in us. In other words, John gets to a point and he says, God is light and those who walk in darkness cannot be in a right relationship with him. And so we must choose whether or not we're going to walk in the light. And here's how we will be able to do that. Here's how we continue to walk in the light. We have to learn to confess our sins. It's the spiritual discipline of confession. It's the spiritual practice of confession. Verse 9 says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, it's conditional. And what he's saying there and what he's pointing to is this idea that salvation is not just a one-time event. Salvation is not just a point in one person's life in which they give their life to Jesus Christ, they enter into the waters of baptism, they receive the forgiveness of the sins, and from that point forward, they no longer have to do anything. He says, no, 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 you have to confess your sins, and that word confess is in a particular tense in the original language, which is the present tense, which means it's an ongoing form of action. And so as he says you have to confess, and you have to confess, and you have to confess, and you have to continue to confess if you want to walk in the light, if you want to have fellowship with God the Father. Because he is light. And so John makes it very, very clear in this moment that we have to confess our sins before God. But the Bible also tells us that we have to confess our sins before one another. In fact, in the book of James, chapter 5 and verse 16, 
James says this. He says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power and it's working. So not only do we have to learn to confess before God, to confess our sins to Him, but we're called to confess to one another. Yet the truth is, is that confession is difficult, and the church has always wrestled with this. But the church has always known that we need to confess, and you can go all the way back to early church fathers and throughout history and see this taking place in the writings of so many people. Let me give you a couple of examples. Augustine of Hippo, he was one of the early church fathers. He once wrote this, he said, The confession of evil works is the first beginning of good works. In other words, in order order to come right before God, to begin doing good works, we have to first confess the evil, the sin within our lives. John Wesley, who was a a preacher in the 1700s, this was a man who was uh, responsible, uh, he and his brother Charles, for uh, developing the uh, Methodist movement and all of the Methodist churches that formed uh, through that. Uh, This is what he had to say about confession. He said, Give me 100 preachers, Or you can insert Christians. Give me 100 Christians who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. Wow. He says, just give me 100. Just give me 100 people who love God and hate sin and the world will change. The kingdom of God will advance. Martin Luther, who was uh, responsible for the Protestant Reformation in all uh, Protestant churches, including our independent uh, non-denominational Christian church, he once said this, he said, Therefore, when I admonish you to confession, I am admonishing you to be a Christian. He didn't even believe you could be a Christian if you're not confessing your sins. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in thinking about confessing to Our brothers, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, of course, was uh, a man who was responsible uh, for uh, an attempt to take Hitler's life, but he was also a pastor and a theologian. He wrote this. He said, Our brother has been given to help us. He hears the confession of our sins in Christ's stead, and he forgives our sins in Christ's name. He keeps the secret confession as God keeps it. When I go to my brother to confess, I'm going to God. Wow. You hear what he's saying? He's saying that when you go to another person who has the Spirit of the living God living within them, and you confess your sins before them, it's as if you're going to God himself. So why don't we do this? Why do we struggle with this? Why do all of us, myself included, struggle with this this concept? Why is this so difficult for so many? Maybe it's because, as uh, Richard Foster says within his book, Celebration of Discipline, we uh, far too often view the church as the fellowship of saints before we see them as the fellowship of sinners. You see, we all have sin in our life we're dealing with. We all have ugliness. We all have dark actions and dark areas. We all have things that we're we're addressing, we're dealing with. And far too often, we don't want people to to know about that, right? We kind of hide that and push that aside, and we don't want them to to see that or to know that or to think that we're not okay, and we prefer to talk about what's good instead of what's bad, and we want to talk about uh, where, how far we, we'll talk about how far we've been as opposed to how far we still need to go, Right? And yet this discipline of spiritual, the spiritual discipline of confession kind of speaks to us and calls us to do that which God has commanded. When I think about the Apostle Paul, we've talked about this before, but when I think about the Apostle Paul, one of the things that strikes me is that he was a man who, as he grew in his faith, saw himself as less and less and less and less. So much so that when he wrote a letter to a guy by the name of Timothy, his mentor, 
He said this in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. He said, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. King James Version says, Of whom I am the chief of all sinners. NIV says, Of whom I am the worst of all. Paul? Really? The worst of all? <laughs> The guy who planted more churches, wrote half the New Testament, is responsible for countless thousands of people coming to Jesus. He's the worst of all. But there was something about the Apostle Paul that as he matured, as he grew in his relationship with Christ, as he understood more and more of what God had done for him, and he, so as he saw the grace of God and what, how God had poured out that grace upon his own life, that he saw himself as more and more and more ugly and impure and in need of so much from God. And yet far too often within our own lives, we're not growing in that same way. We're not recognizing that same need. We're not confessing our sins as we should. So I don't know about you, but I, I want to see that change. I'm tired of wearing the mask, so to speak. Let's just be real with one another. Let's be honest. Let's be willing to say to, to each other that we don't have it all figured out and there are things in all of our lives we're, we're dealing with and wrestling with, sin, that we hate, that we want and removed, and we would do anything it takes to, to have that completely removed so that we could continue to be in this incredible relationship with God and we want to walk in the light as He is in the light. But to do that, we've got to take off that mask and stop pretending. So this morning, I want to give to you some, some steps to help us to do that together. I want to use that word mask as kind of an acronym just to help us to remember some things that we need to be doing. The letter M stands for make. Make a choice. If it's true, as John has stated, that God is light, then we have a choice to make. Do I want to fellowship with God? Do I want to walk in the light or, or not? It's a choice that we have to make. Some of us are going to make different choices, but we all need to, to make that choice. And if we want to walk in the light as he is in the light, we need to be able to say to God, God, I want to do that. I want to walk with you. I'm tired of being in the darkness. I'm tired of living my life and pretending to be somebody that I'm not. I want to remove those things so that I can walk with you, have fellowship with you. We need to make a choice. We need to say those words. The letter A stands for ask. Ask God for help. As we begin to think about our lives, we begin to think about the things that are happening within our lives, we need to ask God to reveal the sin that is there. I don't know about you, but when I think about sins in my own life, I think about, okay, I can think about this and this and this, but I have this, this list, right, of, of things that I know are, are sinful, or things that I know needs to change, that are not things that would honor God, but what are those other things? <laughs> What is that other, those other things that God has not yet revealed, maybe we're not even ready for, that if I truly understood all these things, that maybe the way I thought about something or the way I said something or the way I treated this person, all these other things, what are those other things that are sinful and God recognizes them, sees them as sin, but I've not yet seen them? That scares me a little bit. So we need to ask God for help. We need to ask Him to reveal that which is in our life that is not of Him. The letter S then stands for speak. Speak to God, hence to others. And this is the point in which we begin to confess. We use words to say, God, I'm sorry for what I've done. And we're reminded of what John had said. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we do that, we can be assured we're going to be cleansed. We're going to receive forgiveness. And so will we do it? Will we say those words to God? God, I am so sorry. I, I, I say things, I do things I do not want to do. I want to change. I want to walk in the light. I want to be in the light as you are in the light. And yet I see these things happening in my life and I just can't fix them. Would you step in and change me? 
Paul said that in his writings in Romans 7. Thing which I want to do, I don't do. Thing which I don't want to do, I do. He experienced that too. We need to say those words. And the letter K then stands for keep practicing daily. Confession is not something we do once. It's not something that we do twice. We need to do that on a regular basis. Confess and confess and confess and confess. Four steps that all of us needs to take. Four steps that are necessary for taking off that mask and revealing who we truly are. Four steps for, for showing God and others that we truly want to be forgiven of the sin that we have in our life. So the question becomes, do we want that? How badly do we want that? How desperate are we to, to have that in our life? To walk in the light as He is in the light and to have fellowship with God the Father, with His Son, with those who are walking in the light as well. So I want to challenge you in a particular way uh, this morning. In your bulletins, uh, you should see a, a yellow card. Let me grab one. Looks like this. It says at the top, Father or Heavenly Father, I've sinned against you. Please forgive me for. And at the bottom has a place for your name. Here's what I want us to do together. If confession is a spiritual discipline that's a corporate discipline that we need to do with one another, I want us to take some time today during worship to ask God to reveal what are the sins that are happening within my life, what are the things that I need forgiveness for, and as we write those things down, I want you to, to put them on paper. Sign your name. And to declare that there are things in my life that need to be forgiven. I need to confess. And then as we enter back into worship, what I want us to do is to come to the front. And there are two wooden boxes. And you'll notice they have little slits on the top of them. I want you to take these cards. And uh, as an act of recognition that you know that having confessed your sins, you're going to be forgiven. I want you to physically tear those up and to put them into the box. And every single time that you hear that tear of another person, I want you to remind yourself that that is a sin being forgiven. That person's sins are being forgiven because they're confessing, confessing over and over again. And as we hear that over and over, it should bring us to tears, honestly. Recognizing how much God has saved uh, us, forgiven us, recognizing how much He's forgiving people today in this place. So that's what I want us to do. Together, as his people, confess the things going on in our lives and then just tear it up in recognition that God has forgiven us because we have confessed. And maybe if we do that, we can follow in the footsteps of a little six year old boy whom I'll call Jacob. And Jacob was a young boy who went to a church service on Ash Wednesday. And while he was there, uh, the, the, the church was going through a, a period of time which they were given an opportunity uh, to go to a confession station. And they were told to write down their sins on a particular piece of paper and to fold it up and then pin it to the cross. And so mom and dad did that and they, they wrote down their sins and then they folded up their piece of paper and they pinned it to the cross. And little Jacob said, well, hey, I want to do that too. And so he grabbed a piece of paper and he took that piece of paper in big block letters, as you can imagine a six-year-old doing, right? And he said, God, forgive me because I'm a liar. Period. Jacob. But then he took that piece of paper and he went over to the cross and he just pinned it straight to the cross. Mom and dad came up to him and said, Jacob, what are you doing? Why didn't you fold that up? Why didn't you just fold it up and pin it to the cross so that no one can see that? Why, why did you leave it open? And he turned and he said, Well, I left it open because I wanted everybody to see who I am and everybody to see what I'm dealing with so that maybe they could help me. The words of a six-year-old boy. 
who is willing to take off the mask and stop pretending to be someone that he was not, and to tell everyone in the church that I am struggling right now with lying. God, please help me. If there are others in the church, help me. I wonder if we can come before God with that same heart today. I wonder if you and I can step before our Heavenly Father and before one another and say, I have sin in my life and I need help. I don't care who knows. I don't care what people think about me. I want to walk in the light because he is in the light. I want to receive the uh, the forgiveness of my sins. I want to confess them in order that I could receive the forgiveness of my sins, just as John promised that I can receive. Can we do that? Can we do that together as a church family? Final truth I want to leave you with this morning is simply this. Take off your mask and grow closer to God and to one another. When we take off our mask and truly reveal who we are before God and one another, he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, as we come before you this morning, and as we just press pause and and think about your word, Father, we are reminded of the need to confess our sins. Confession is not easy because it requires us to admit to the things that we have done wrong. Father, I know that within all of our lives there are things that we all deal with, For some, it may be anger. For others, it might be greed. For others, it it might be some sort of uh, addiction or pornography. It could be a whole host of things, but we all deal with things, Lord, that needs to be confessed and acknowledged so that they can be forgiven. And so would you help us to be the church? Would you help us to be who we're called to be? Would you help us to realize, God, that we need to confess to you and to one another so that we might receive the forgiveness of our sins? so we might receive what you have and you desire for us to have. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our time together in your word. We pray that over the next few moments as we reflect upon what your son has done for us, as we reflect upon the sin in our life, that you will reveal what needs to be revealed, and you will help us to be bold and to be brave and confess whatever needs to be confessed before the church, and before you. We pray all these things in your Son's name. Amen.